Carol Bloom and biographer Jay Martin, part of a panel considering the life and work of writer Nathaniel West. Now we take you to the campus of American University in Washington, D.C., to hear Kareem Abdul-Jabbar talk about his book, Black Profiles and Courage, a Legacy of African American Achievement. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is a Hall of Fame basketball player and the author of two previous volumes of autobiography. He spoke at an event hosted by the school's Kennedy Political Union. Thank you very much. And um, I, I would just like to tell everyone that if they buy my book, I will certainly sign it without any hesitation or questions asked. I'm here uh, in, in connection with uh, Midnight Madness, which is all about uh, practicing as soon as possible after it, it's legal in the NC, by the NC2A to, to practice. So I guess that all of you here are, are some type of basketball fiends and uh, want to talk about that, and, and, and we will talk about that. But uh, I want to talk about what's happening with uh, college basketball, because uh, as all of you are interested in that, you must have observed a decline in the quality of the product. And uh, this is not an accident. This is due to a, a number of things, and uh, we want to identify those things, and uh, maybe you guys can uh, have your voices heard in, in changing the situation, because it's, it's, it's a situation that is going from bad to worse. Decline is, is really uh, due to the fact that nothing much is, ex is expected of athletes. Uh, and I'm not just talking about athletes from the inner city. Uh, it has been uh, more or less a staple caricature of, of America that uh, a dumb jock is, is, is part of the landscape. And uh, this, has, this has an insidious effect on, on all of our young people. And it, it gets worse uh, as the uh, poverty and ignorance and racism get involved in, in addition to that situation, and it, it really has a tragic effect on, on people's lives. These people are given up on intentionally uh, because they are ripe to be exploited and uh, used to make money. Uh, this is not uh, an old theme in, in American life. Uh, slaves were brought over here, and for any number of reasons was given uh, for them being in, in, in slavery. Uh, but the, what the bottom line on it was, uh, people made money off of it. Uh, in the years leading up to the Civil War, the slave population of this nation produced in, enough cotton to make America the producer of 95% of the world's commercial cotton. In addition to that, uh, the ready-to-wear to clothing industry took off as, as a result of the availability in America of, of cheap uh, materials, uh, cotton being uh, cut up and uh, sold as pants and shirts and et cetera around the world. America had a head start on that. In addition, American industries, uh, our industrial revolution was fueled by the money from that, uh, by the uh, exportation of the technology that made uh, knitting mills and uh, cloth uh, factories uh, overseas. Uh, other nations tried to get in on it and uh, we found ourselves a leader in technology. All this was based on the slave economy of the South. And uh, there was certainly uh, a great amount of wealth produced and absorbed by uh, Southerners and, and other Americans. And no credit was ever really given to the slaves. And uh, they were totally exploited. So this type of exploitation is something that uh, finds its way uh, into our lives as Americans one way or another. And uh, some of us are successful in uh, overcoming it and uh, turning the tables and, and making it right. And uh, for, for many reasons, some, some of us aren't. Ignorant athletes, though, are a problem because uh, they can't play as well as an intelligent athlete. Um, we, have, we have a situation now where college coaches are more like babysitters. All right? They're going to get some kid that has been told that all he needs to offer the world is his athletic ability. and. Uh, any maturity that he would develop, uh, any in intellectual uh, capacities that, that he should develop, they fall by the wayside. And uh, it, it's OK to exploit people this way. And that, that is something that has to stop. 
That is something that uh, we don't need in this country, and uh, we have to take, make a conscious effort to stop that. Sometimes uh, youth culture also is a factor in all of this. Um, it's, it's not, and, you know, Huck, Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer, they played hooky, okay? They didn't, want to, they didn't want to go to school. Kids today don't want to go to school. And we have a phenomenon in the youth culture where uh, a lot of kids start running the street as soon as they're able, when they're 10 or 12 years old. They continue to do this until they're maybe 16 years old, and then they realize that they are useless in today's society. At that point, they start acting uh, very hostile because in knowing that they are useless, uh, the anger and uh, frustration at being able to do the things they want to do, buy the things they want to buy, go to the places they want to go, they can't do it. They can't cope. And uh, they eventually end up being a problem. All the problems that we have uh, with teen pregnancy, violent crime, substance abuse, vandalism, uh, in, especially in inner city communities, are usually associated with young people from this, from this category. And uh, within 15 years, they, they produce more children that end up being a problem in another 15 years. And this situation keeps rolling over on itself. And we have a whole lot of uh, young people that end up being fodder for prisons uh, or prey to any number of uh, just tragic and uh, avoidable circumstances. We have to do something about that. And the only way to, to get at that problem and deal with it is to get to these people while they are young. Uh, if it doesn't happen when they're young, it, it usually doesn't happen. One example that I, I always think of and I refer to when I speak is, uh, it, it should be familiar with you people here in the, in the Washington, D.C. area because uh, you have a classic example of what happened. There was a football player uh, that played for the Washington Redskins named Dexter Manley. He was all pro. He was one of the best that ever did it. Um, and he played here for you know, six or eight years. And uh, toward the end of that time, we found out that he was illiterate. All right, he could not read or write. He learned how to write by writing his name, signing autographs. Yet, he was able to attend a major American university uh, for four years. Now, at that university, I don't, I don't know what that university was about, but to have someone there for four years who could not read or write is, is a disgrace. Yet, uh, when this happened, no one got fired. Uh, no one was embarrassed. Uh, I don't think there were very many news stories uh, dealing with what happened at this university and why Dexter Manley was uh, able to be uh, exploited that way. It's not, it's not an old story. It's a shameful story, but it's not an old story. And uh, some, somehow we've got to change that. But th there are things in the offing that, that, that are working on that. I'm going to quote from today's New York Times because there was a story in there today that uh, really, uh, in, in my mind, delineates uh, what, what the problem is. There's a young man uh, who played uh, college football in, uh, in Texas in, in the 70s. His name is Kent Waltrip. And uh, in playing college football, he was uh, injured and became quadriplegic. He has since recovered a lot. He's uh, now a parent, and he's regained use of his arms. But uh, he, sued the, uh, he sued the university that he played at because he felt that uh, this is clearly a case of uh, exploitation. Uh, I, I'm going to quote now from the New York Times. Waltrip is challenging the relationship and legal responsibilities that universities have to scholarship athletes. Today, in a state district courtroom in Austin, Texas, a jury will be selected to decide whether Waltrip was an employee of TCU at the time of his injury and is thus covered by workers' compensation laws. The legal issue may be sp specific to the Texas courts, Statues vary from state to state. But if Waltrip wins, the decision would become the first step in redefining college athletes as, labor for, as a labor force entitled to basic employee rights. That would start a revolution in college sports, for which, ye which for years have been presided over by the National Collegiate Athletic Association, the not-for-profit not group that, sh that is shielded from business income taxes, any trust scrutiny, and a variety of labor practices such as collective bargaining. 
At the 1993 Workers' Compensation Commission, uh, which was involved in this case, the, uh, the uh, colleges went and insured themselves when these problems started uh, popping up. And uh, at that point, universities were required to provide workers' compensation insurance, but uh, they, they started complaining that that would bankrupt them. It also said that uh, Mr. Waltrip was recruited as a student for his academic prowess, not as an athlete for his football talent, according to the hearing transcripts. Now, Waltrip concedes that he was a bright student and a member of the National Honor Society, but he said no one from the Academic Affairs Office ever came to his hometown of Alvin, Texas. You know who came to Alvin and brought me, and brought me steak, Waltrip said. You know who sat at my living room and told my mama that, any, that if anything happened to me, the school would take care of it, the football coach. And he never talked about school. The only thing he ever talked about was football. Okay, this, this is a clear case of, of exploitation. And uh, too many times, uh, universities end up on the wrong side of the situation. It, in many cases, it is a disgrace. And it's something that has to be dealt with. About two or three years ago, uh, I had the nerve to suggest that academic standards should be raised for college athletes, uh, especially kids from the inner city. I think if they're going to be student athletes, that they should actually qualify for that. And uh, there should be some means of gauging that. And if not, they can go on into the, into the professional ranks. There's no longer the uh, legal limbo uh, involved there. Um, Coach Cheney from Temple University, upon hearing my comments, uh, called me a, a jerk and an idiot and told me and, and, and gave a press conference saying that I didn't know what I was talking about. Yet, at, at that time, uh, no senior had graduated from the Temple University basketball program in almost five years. So we have a whole problem here of, uh, you know, self-serving interests that uh, really uh, People who are supposed to be educating people um, really are looking for all the excuses they can find not to be educating people. Now, I would not have come here to talk tonight if American University did not, if, if American University f fell in that category. But I'm very happy to say that American University graduates between 65 and 70 percent of the athletes in the basketball program, of the, of the uh, people here on scholarship, et cetera. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy about that. Of course, uh, your athletic director, he graduated from UCLA and is a friend of mine, so maybe that might have something to do with it. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I think that uh, the way things happen here at American University should be the way things happen across the country. Uh, every university that you go to, there's a different, there's a different cut on it. And uh, we need to, to get some uniformity out there. We need to get some sincere people involved in dealing with, with college athletes. Now, I uh, had an experience in my life that really uh, brought all of this full circle for me because uh, I'm a proud parent and uh, I have a son that is a senior in high school this year. Uh, but this was when he was in uh, ninth grade, uh, excuse me, 10th grade. He had an assignment to do a report on a significant black historical figure. And he could not get any information on that. He, he looked in his school library, he looked in the Los Angeles Public Library, and uh, found nothing. Um, he was desperate by the time he came to me. And uh, I was able to help him with his project, because I've read about these things. I was a history major at UCLA. But uh, it, it shocked me that there was no book available that covered the subject of uh, black American history, and uh, especially for young people, uh, people who need to understand what it is about America that relates to them. So uh, I was able to uh, speak to my literary attorney who said, hey, we've been waiting for somebody to do this book for a while. Uh, and the niche was left there for me to, to take advantage of it, and, and I did. I'm very happy I did that because it brought me all the way back to uh, something that I loved and I'd forgotten completely about. Uh, and I realized at that point that I was so fortunate not to have ended up in the same position as Dexter Manley. I did have something to fall back on. My parents made sure that uh, we identified me going to a university early on in my life. I was in the sixth or seventh grade and they said, hey, this is the way to go. This is the only way for you to make it here in America. 
and uh, I, I never ever uh, considered them uh, to to be uh, off of it. I, I thought that they they knew what they were doing, and um, I followed their advice. Thank heaven. Um, the reason that I, I stole uh, President Kennedy's uh, title had to do with uh, the type of courage that I wanted to exemplify in, in, my, in uh, speaking about black Americans. Uh, president Kennedy, uh, while he was president, uh, decided that he was going to enforce civil rights legislation for all Americans. And uh, all of his political advisors told him that if he did that, he was going to lose the next election because he would not get any Southern votes. Uh, President Kennedy said that he didn't care about that. Uh, he was going to go ahead and do that anyway. And uh, his leadership on these issues uh, still is something that Americans point to with pride at, at this point. But uh, at the time, it was, it was touch and go. He had to have some real personal courage and backbone to, to stay the course with what he thought was right. But he did it, and uh, we, have, we have all benefited from that. This is the type of thing that uh, I wanted to point out for, uh, for all of us to, to share uh, in, in recognizing and uh, supporting people who, who exemplify this type of courage. The person in, uh, in my book who, for me, epitomizes uh, the courage and determination uh, that we need to convey to our, to our young athletes is uh, Frederick Douglass. I have a whole chapter on him, and, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about it because uh, that, that is the most extreme example, but it is a pure American story that uh, we all need to, to understand and, and talk about. Frederick Douglass was born Frederick Bailey and, uh, in Maryland, and he was not uh, uh, born at a time when things were, were very good for slaves. And, uh, he was uh, eventually separated from his mother uh, when he was six years old. He never saw her again after that point. Uh, he spent a lot of uh, time, most of his life, trying to figure out what day he was born because uh, he couldn't even talk to his mother about that. But uh, he was eventually uh, sold to a family in Baltimore and uh, went to live with them. And it was uh, a family of new, nouveau riche people. The, uh, the, the head of the household, had a new wife who really had never been around slaves. And at first she treated Frederick like he was a human being. Uh, he had adapted the, uh, the mannerisms of uh, most slaves in being very uh, condescending and uh, subservient and completely submissive uh, in, in the presence of uh, his masters. And he, uh, he was told by his mistress, uh, Hey, don't, don't act like that. You know, just stand up straight, speak clearly. Uh, you can look me in the eye. It's okay. And uh, here, I'm, I'm going to teach you how to write and read. So this went on for a couple of months until uh, the man of the, of, of the household uh, found out about it. And uh, when he found out about it, he, he exploded. Uh, Frederick was sent outside, and he uh, castigated his wife, telling her that uh, he, she shouldn't do that, uh, that it was totally ridiculous for, for her to do that because if a slave got the tools of knowledge, uh, he would be unrulable and eventually be ruined as a slave and had to, uh, he, he, it was going to be a problem. Um, at that point, her, her conduct changed 180 degrees. But in overhearing all of this, Frederick Douglass picked up a key idea for him. Uh, and that was the fact that knowledge was the power that made you equal. He understood that. He didn't, uh, he didn't have any equivocations about what that meant. He knew that if he knew how to read and write and uh, was an intelligent human being, that he could beat this system and uh, get out from, the, uh, from this cruel and inhuman treatment that uh, he, he was subjected to. Um, so then he, he went on a crusade to learn how to read, and uh, he, 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 resulted, uh, he, he resorted to a number of different uh, ruses, etc. Et uh, when his masters would leave the home, he would go in and, and, and read anything that was there, newspapers, books, periodicals, anything that was there. Any words that he didn't know, he would write down and uh, take them uh, away with him and look them up at, at an opportune time, which uh, oftentimes was, was weeks later. 
but uh, he made sure that every day was a day that he gained a little bit of knowledge. On the streets, he had a little scam going. He, he would get, like, biscuits and jam and talk to, the, to some of the white kids who were, who had, uh, who were taking uh, school lessons. He would uh, maybe try to get a primer from them or have them go over their lessons with him and uh, identify words and letters, uh, sentence structure, etc. And he did this on the street. It was, it was something out of our gang, but it worked for him. He started to, to accumulate more knowledge. He learned how to write his letters and print uh, after he went and started working as an apprentice in one of the Baltimore shipyards. He was a caulker uh, working on, on the uh, longboats that, uh, that they made there in the, in the shipyard. And he would watch uh, the carpenters printing, carving letters into the wood and learned how to, how to, how to write upper and lowercase letters. Uh, all this was done surreptuously. Nobody knew that, that this was going on. And um, in, in time, over a number of years, he became quite literate. He then uh, started to save money from any of the jobs that he had because uh, he could work for his, for his own uh, benefit for one day a week. Uh, the other five days, he, he worked for his master. But he, he started buying books. He bought a book on oratory and, uh, again, had another revelation in reading a book where a slave master and a slave had a debate as to the validity of slavery. Uh, for Frederick, this was something, oh, you know, this was something that he, he really wanted to get into. And when he understood, when he got to the point where he could understand the meaning of the words, the power of the words just swept him away, and he understood that he had to go, and that he had to be out of slavery. Yet, you know, he was still in, in a very, very bad situation, uh, being, uh, being a slave. His next move at that point, uh, now that he knew that he had to do something, was, hey, when am I going to do something? And he waited and waited, tried to enlist uh, friends from among the other slaves that he knew. Just, it didn't work very well. And he eventually uh, made a, a, an abortive uh, uh, an escape attempt. He was captured. Uh, he wasn't in prison long. Uh, but at that point, they said, uh, your problem. We're going to have to send you to be broken. So they sent Frederick to a, a person who whose only job was to intimidate slaves that were a problem. And uh, he, he took several beatings. He was there for, for a, a, a number of months and took several beatings. And it got to the point where he thought he was going to die from a beating when he realized that he had to fight back. And uh, the, uh, the person that, uh, it, it was a, a very cruel and uh, inhuman type of person, of course, uh, that was, was beating on him, all of a sudden Frederick turned on him and started uh, to retaliate. And they got locked in a, in a death struggle there, uh, which went on for almost an hour. Uh, the master, the, this, the man who was uh, used to, to break slaves, called some of the other slaves in to help him. They wouldn't help him, and, and Frederick nearly choked him to death. Um, it didn't work uh, in, in so far as Frederick was not able to, uh, to kill him although he did try. Uh, but from that point on, that, that man did not want to have anything to do with Frederick Douglass. He thought he was crazy and uh, sent him back home. Um, eventually, Frederick uh, recruited some friends uh, who helped him in that they stole a naval uniform for him. He forged some papers on his own. And uh, from where he was in, uh, in Maryland, he got to Baltimore, took a ferry boat, uh, to Delaware, uh, and then from Delaware he took the train to Philadelphia and was finally free. He kept on moving on to uh, New York and eventually to uh, Massachusetts where he was uh, a, a bright light and leader of the abolitionist movement. But he would never ever, ever at any point have ascended to that point if he did not have the desire to know. Knowledge is power. It, it is the most powerful thing that any of us uh, or any group of people can, can master. And if we can master it, we can do anything that we want to do. So I would just encourage all of you here who are uh, basketball fans and uh, fans of, of athletes uh, in, in any way that you can, either subtly or overtly, 
encourage the kids here at uh, American University to take full advantage of this opportunity. Too many of them will see it only as a chance to be seen by the NBA. And uh, we need more than that from our young people. And I hope that, that all of you will, uh, will understand that uh, to encourage people to, to do everything they can, both physically and mentally, and to excel in every way that they can is the only way that uh, we get the best from our best. And uh, our student athletes should be uh, among the best that we know. So that is the end of uh, my formal words uh, of, for this evening. If there's anybody with any questions, uh, the microphones are right here uh, at, at the front aisle. And I, I'd like to hear from you. Thank you. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you for speaking. I think it's incredible that someone of uh, your stature is finally uh, doing something about this problem. I was reading the New York Times about three weeks ago after Kevin Garnett signed his $120 million contract, saying that on top of education, the other problem is we take these athletes out of inner cities and we give them an obscene amount of money right up front, which causes them to get involved with drugs, crime. Uh, when you saw Kevin Garnett got a $120 million at 20 years old, 21 years old, what was your first reaction? Well, I, my first reaction is, uh, how come I'm not playing right now? <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I do know Kevin. He's, he's not a stupid young man, although he didn't do, do well in college. But um, I think he's an exceptional case. Um, I think uh, what we, we should uh, try to focus on is people like Again, another uh, young man who's here in the Washington, D.C. area, Jawan Howard. Jawan Howard is making almost that much money, but at the same time, he thought it was important to graduate from college. He went and went, took classes uh, in the off-season and graduated with his class from the University of Michigan. And he, he's making about seven, eight million dollars a year. I think that, that uh, commitment to his education really is a great thing. I, I try to talk about it when you know, I, I talk to young people because all they see are, are, are people like Dennis Rodman and uh, you know, others who are not educated and are, don't have uh, anything good to offer in terms of uh, being a role model. So you know, I'm, I'm happy to see people like Juwan doing what they're doing. Emmett Smith did more or less the same thing. He was uh, involved in uh, uh, a, a training program in off-season one summer. I think it was two summers ago. That's when he signed for the $40 million. But he was, at, he was at school in Florida getting his degree because he had told his parents that he was going to do that, and that was important to him. Even though he missed the, the training program, the Dallas Cowboys said, go ahead and on and do that. So, you know, I, I think if, if, the, if the teams uh, understand that uh, what they're doing is enhancing uh, the productivity of the people that come to play for them, um, we'll, we'll, have a, we'll have a different situation. Yes. Yeah. Um, do you think that the NBA's continued encouragement of uh, young athletes coming out early for, for, the, college, for the college draft? I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't hear do you feel that you uh, Sorry. Do you think that the NBA's encouragement of young athletes coming out for the draft early, um, out of college or out of high school now, um, contributes to this uh, process of exploitation of the athletes? And if so, do you think they should continue to allow athletes to do that? Uh, I don't think it's the NBA's fault. Um, this is a common thing. This isn't new, okay? A lot of people think this is new because they see the money that people like Kevin Garnett is getting. But this is an old story. Michael Chang didn't go to college, okay? He, went, he left high school, started playing professional tennis. Got guys leaving high school to play professional baseball, professional hockey. That's been going on for decades. Uh, I think basketball players are subjected to a double standard there. It's just they're getting so much money, and it's, they're so visible that people saying, what's going on here? Uh, because that, that was one area that was restricted. But uh, the fact is that uh, combinations in restraint of trade are not allowed. That's, uh, you know, antitrust legislation is, is, has, has made it possible for them, uh, for young people to uh, get into the pro ranks earlier than their graduating class. And, you know, it, it's just the marketplace. It's, it's well, the forces of the marketplace. Would, would you say that this contradicts the message that education is more important than basketball starting? I don't think it's a contradictory message. 
but um, they do have to get their, their act straight. I mean, I, I think maybe, I personally, if I was commissioner of the NBA, I would try something like no one could come in the NBA unless they were 21 years old or they had a, a bachelor's degree. You know, I would do it like that, and it, I think it would, it would make uh, young men a lot more uh, keen on staying in school and doing something while they're in school. You know, Dexter Manley went to school for four years, all right, and didn't get much out of it. So wow. it, it, it's got to start a little bit earlier than that. Well, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is, like, does that contribute to the fact that maybe athletics is more important than getting a decent education, like a player like... Dexter Manley can go through college for four years without reading because he's a good athlete. Would you um, say that that's the, this fact? Well, that, that is a professional skill that uh, somebody's going to exploit one way or another, and uh, it's going to happen. Okay. Yes? Um, I was just wondering, um, not a non-basketball, but just as a historian and as a writer, who do you see as looking forward or looking past Rosa Parks? Who would you like to add to this book saying, okay, who today or who tomorrow is really leading the African-American cause, because it's really, you know, it's not over. And would you say it's sort of an August Wilson or a Denzel Washington? Who, who do you see as saying, for this generation, you know, or your generation, who should be in this book next? Um, I stayed away from uh, modern uh, figures in my book because uh, I think that they, they do get more coverage. Sometimes the coverage is, is biased, um, especially in, in dealing with, uh, with black personalities. Um, in, in, our, in our country, the black people who get the most coverage on the news, for example, are black criminals, okay? And uh, black people that are doing uh, innovative things in computers or medicine or business are, are you, nobody can name one of them here. Um, sometimes the, uh, the media, they, they go nuts when they get one personality, such as, let's say, Suge Knight, all right? Suge Knight was a black athlete in the entertainment business who was involved in criminal activity. That covers it all for them, okay? They had, they had a field day with him, you know? And they, they, they sold copy. But, uh, you know, people doing ordinary jobs and that are not uh, that uh, newsworthy or able to sell copy, you know, they don't get the attention that, that they deserve. And in minority communities, those kids need to see these people and they need to understand the, what, it, what is out there for them to, to deal with. So in my book, I did not have any athletes or any entertainers. Um, and you know, I hope that uh, a, a young person reading my book will see the story about uh, Louis Latimer who invented the filament for the light bulb and made Edison's uh, invention work, that they do have a future in science, uh, that they do have a future in technology or what, what have you. That, that, was, that was my purpose. Yes? Hi. I'd like to thank you for coming here. Um, I know at UCLA you had the opportunity to train in the martial arts with Bruce Lee, and I'd like to know what you learned from Bruce that stays with you today and what Bruce Lee meant to you. Well, uh, Bruce, first of all, was a friend, and um, I'll, I'll never forget him on, on that level. Um, what he taught me was to be prepared. Uh, you, you have to be on the cutting edge of knowledge. Uh, he was the cutting edge of knowledge when, when he was teaching, and uh, that, that has moved on now, and the martial arts uh, has evolved. But uh, understanding where you are and where things are going is, is one, one lesson that I get from him that uh, stays with me, and I hope to pass it on to my kids and have them understand and help them uh, have a successful life. Thank you. The well-dressed young lady in, in right here. I've really enjoyed your writings and I appreciate the fact that the books that have your name on them are actually written by you. I know a lot of um, athletes do have their books ghost written for them. Um, and I've also enjoyed watching you play. I saw you play your last season in Denver against the Nuggets. I'm just curious what you did with all the gifts that you were given by all the NBA teams. What I did with all the gifts, okay. I, I listened to all the CDs. <laughs> I did not fit in the boat that they gave me. Uh, the more. <laughs> the motorcycle was great, um, and I, I took trips. My, my parents took the trip around the world, and they loved it. Um, I, I just really, I enjoyed the, the goodwill and um, being able to connect with everyone. That's really been uh, good for me since I retired, because uh, while I was playing, I, I was so tunnel vision on, on my game, I really didn't get to relate to the fans and everything. So since I've been uh, 
a civilian, it, it's been a lot easier to, to know and appreciate the fans, and, and that's been the good part of uh, my retirement. And what became of the gold nugget on the chain? The gold nugget, I still have the gold nugget on the chain. My mother wore it, and my mother passed in April, and uh, I still have it. Okay. Yes. How are you doing tonight? I just want to uh, say that I read your book some time ago, and uh, I really enjoyed it. It's, it's really enlightening. Um, I have like a two-part question. Um, the first one deals with uh, President Clinton's uh, race initiative, uh, you know, in terms of engaging uh, America in a race discussion. Uh, I just wanted to know what's your opinion about that. And um, what's my opinion on what? President Clinton. Uh, on President new, Clinton's new initiative on race. Okay. Uh, trying to uh, engage, you know, Americans in race. Okay. I, I, I'm. I really think that uh, President Clinton is. Uh, thinking the right way. Uh, a lot of times people have ideas and people scoff at them, but it, 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 it's about a consciousness and a, a desire to do, do good. And I think that's what President Clinton's initiatives are all about. He wants Americans to talk to each other and understand each other. There's so much that connects us as Americans uh, of different races. And everything that, uh, not, I won't say everything, but too much emphasis is given to the things that divide us. And when we start to understand what c keeps us together as Americans and, and how we're connected as Americans, uh, people's attitudes change. Uh, and just as you, you say you've gotten something from my book, I, I've gotten a lot of feed feedback from people who've read my book and you know, they'll, they'll read about someone like Crispus Attucks and they had no idea that the first person to die in the American Revolution was a black man who died in the, in the Boston Massacre. They have no idea. They have no idea that blacks have contributed anything because they've been reading what the media wants us to read or what uh, maybe racist historians put in our, in our textbooks, uh, especially like when I was a boy. I, I had no idea of any of these, these uh, facts. So uh, I think what President Clinton's doing is, is indicative of people trying to really get to the point where we, we are a united nation and uh, we, we do have ties that bind and if we acknowledge them and uh, promote them, uh, it, it's going to be a better nation. Uh, one more. I, I like to know also, when do you think things will change for African Americans in terms of, you know, the truth being told about, you know, contributions? You mentioned it earlier before. Oh, well, like in my case, I, I thought that when my son came to me and wanted to know about black historical figures, I, I thought that somebody had done this book since I graduated from college, you know, but nobody had done it. and. Uh, I realized that the guy in the mirror was the guy that should do it, you know, as far as I was concerned. You know, I was trained. I, it was really funny. You know, I, I was an English minor and a history major. And, uh, you know, I was really scared to attempt this, you know, but the book is about history and it's in English and, you know, I should be able to do it. <laughs> and, but I was, I was scared, you know, it was, it was silly. You know, it's like somebody, a kid that you know can ride a two-wheel bike, but he's scared to try, you know, and the training wheels are off and, you know, I had to go for it. But it's been a good experience, and uh, it's really, it really helped me reconnect uh, with, with some energy and, uh, and, and people that, that I really needed to reconnect with. All right, thank thank you. you. Yes. In your book, you quote the proverb that sticks in a bundle are unbreakable. I was wondering how you felt on Louis Farrakhan's Day of Atonement for the black community. How I felt on Louis Farrakhan's what? Day of Atonement. I, I, I did? Day of Atonement tomorrow. Um, oh, Day of Atonement. Um, I do not see eye to eye with Minister Farrakhan, all right? Uh, if he, what he's talking about is uh, freedom, justice, and equality for black Americans, I'm for that. But uh, he's been kind of vague or hostile in terms of methodology. So, you know, I, I, have, I have a problem with that. Uh, I do, do not go around trying to pick fights with him or his group, but uh, I would like to hear them speak in positive terms. I, I've only heard him speak in negative terms, uh, making black people angry about the history of uh, their experience in America, but not offering any real uh, solutions or plans to, to try to change things. And I, I've had problems with Minister Farrakhan on, on that level. Okay. Yes. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, what are your thoughts on the WNBA, and how do you see them progressing in the future? Thank you. Well, I, I think the WNBA is, is uh, part of a, a whole trend that is going to help American women. Um, American women for a long time have been told that, th that they shouldn't be athletes. 
uh, that they were too cute to be athletes, um, that they shouldn't try to be athletes, and for that reason they have uh, totally failed to fully develop their athletic potential. So anything that, that gives women the, the knowledge and uh, incentive to, to be athletes and, and learn what that's about, I think it's going to benefit them. It'll certainly benefit our nation. Uh, I, I was speaking up in Boston and uh, I heard a woman relate some really startling facts. Women who were involved in uh, team sports, uh, whether on the high school or college level, when they go into the business world, they are able to cope. They understand what it means to roll with the punches and you know that they're not going to win every time. Uh, when things go bad, please forgive the expression, they can take it like a man. It's, it's not, you know, it's, it's changing the, the, the playing field. And I, I think that's an important thing. And, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the NC2A title that uh, made it necessary for universities to seriously think about having a women's sports program, I think this is just going to help benefit a, a very badly neglected uh, group of, uh, of Americans who, who need to develop their, their uh, athletic potential. Yeah. Um, hello. Um, first, I would like to say that uh, uh, since you retired, no one's quite mastered the skyhook uh, the way uh, you, you have. Uh, and uh, second, I, I want to ask you a question. Uh, in your distinguished career uh, in college and uh, at, in, a, in the NBA, did you ever confront a situation or have to use your profile and courage, your own inner courage, to overcome a racism and bias as a black athlete? Uh, I was never really con confronted in a, in a bad situation uh, such as you described where uh, racism was, uh, was uh, you know, I was attacked in a, in a, in a verbally or physically in, in for, for racial motivations. I mean, the, the worst that came was uh, at the NC2As when, uh, 1967, when I played on my first NC2A championship and some, uh, some Southerners yelled some, some nasty words out when I was down in, in Louisville for the NC2A finals. But, you know, I, I consider that uh, a nothing event. Nothing major ever really happened to me like that. Yes? Um, out of the coaches and players that you've encountered, who has taught you the most, not only about basketball, but like as life, in life as well? Geez, I, I, I feel I learned the most about basketball from uh, my high school coach and my high school career. Uh, by the time I got to UCLA, uh, I was totally simpatico with Coach Wooden. Um, I'd been through a lot, and uh, playing in New York City uh, makes, makes you a mature basketball player early. Uh, it's like that in big cities. So uh, I, I was very fortunate to, uh, to have had that experience. Uh, but certainly I, I learned from Coach Wooden's example as to how to make my preparations pay off and, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the further lessons of, uh, of, of what, you know, professional life is all about. Yeah. In this country, we live in a free market where everybody has the choice to go into whatever field they'd like to go into. And if you're an attorney or you're a businessman, there's no stipulations on how athletically fit you have to be. And I'm curious as to why um, you've chosen it as your goal to make people who have chosen the sports field to make their career and to excel in that field, why there should be stipulations on how academically um, challenged they've forced themselves to be when people have the freedom and the right to choose where they would like to be and they should be able to choose how intelligent or how, how broad their horizons are and how, or how narrow their scope is. Well, um, what you are stating is uh, a very strong case for mediocrity. Um, I don't think most parents in this country want mediocrity to be the hallmark of their kids. I think they the want right? uh, their kids to have an opportunity to develop their potential to its utmost. And that's, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about giving every, everyone a chance to shine on all levels. And if we limit their outlook by telling them that, you know, all right, focus on athletics, and uh, two days from now, they step in a hole and twist their knee and can't continue in athletics, what are they going to do? Uh, are they going to end up like Dexter Manley? That's, that's 
why I have I've taken this position that I have. Yes. Uh, I want to say first of all that I respect very much everything you do outside of basketball. I feel very lucky that I had you as a role model as a child rather well, thank you. than <laughs> someone else. Um, but I do have a basketball question. Sure. Um, I was actually talking with Oscar Robertson about he was saying some of the young people today in the game how they would fare against him and everyone back then. I was wondering who you thought was most dominant back then, whether they compare today's players, how they would do against each other. Um, that, that's very hard to, to determine how today's players would do against uh, players from your. You know, that, that, how can you do that? The only way you can determine that is to put them out there on the court. But I would have to agree with Oscar. I, I don't think there's anybody today that could have guarded him. Um, I, I'm pretty convinced of that. Uh, Having played against him and played against the, some of the dominant players that, that are out there today, they, they wouldn't have done too good against Oscar. Has the game changed in any way since the 70s that would make it being dominant? The game has not changed a, at all. I think the people playing the game uh, really have uh, lost uh, some fundamental knowledge in terms of how to play it. Um, now it's all a lot more about athletic, athletic talent than it is about five guys working together to, to achieve something. So uh, I think there's been something lost and there has been something gained. But uh, everybody's speaking about the fact that it's not interesting to watch the game anymore because you, you don't have enough smart teams out there that can, that can do a number of things. Uh, you think about the Celtic teams in the 80s, they had guys that could play three, three different positions in, in a couple of different places and that were smart and had the, had the fire of competition in them. Nowadays, you have people like Derek Coleman who, you know, if he doesn't feel like playing, uh, tells the coach that, uh, you know, his, his stocks went down and he's depressed and he can't play, you know. It's, uh, it's really crazy. Uh, I would, uh, if I was coaching, I'd have to have some <laughs> boxing gloves or something, you know. You know boxing gloves would be a necessary element of coaching. You know, it's, it's getting to that point. Yes. In your uh, speech earlier, you mentioned your uh, desire for knowledge and your parents uh, as key elements in your life that helped you to uh, succeed. What are some of the other uh, elements in your life that you think have helped you to achieve the successes that you clearly have? Well, you know, after my parents, I think it has been mainly good luck. You know, I was fortunate not to get, not to get hurt. You know, I, I got good coaching. I got good advice from mainly from, from the people around me uh, in terms of uh, what to do, uh, how to keep my career going. Uh, but I think the key there was my parents. Uh, you know, my mom and dad did a, gr did a great job in pointing me in the right direction and uh, having me understand that, that it would work. You know, if, if you stuck with it, it would work. Yes? I was wondering uh, if you thought that if Michael Jordan is the greatest player to ever play the game of basketball, is Michael Jordan the greatest player who ever played the game of basketball? Well, according to most people, he's the only person that's ever played the game of basketball. Uh, he's the best player in the game now. And uh, I don't know uh, if he's the greatest ever. He's certainly one of them. And after that, I, I get out of the argument. I, and it's very fortunate that I didn't play guard, so I don't have to play, compare myself to him. Because uh, that would be another argument. Well, it looks like we're out of questions. I want to thank all of you for your attention and your time. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, I, ho I hope all of you uh, appreciate the fact of the fact of what your, um, your student athletes that play on the varsity basketball team, what they go through to come out here and compete for you. And I hope you show them some appreciation for that and uh, give them some support that way. Uh, go Eagles and uh, all the best. <laughs>
In a moment, scholars and critics discuss the life of...